all aspects of vision rehabilitation therapy. Um, she, and her experiences include both direct service and administration. She earned her bachelor's degree in vision rehabilitation therapy from Florida State University in Tallahassee and her master's degree from DePaul University in Chicago, Illinois. Lenore served as a vision rehabilitation therapist in Lafayette, Indiana, as a center-based VRT at Bosma Rehabilitation Center in, in, in Indianapolis. And then she spent 14 years as the director of Indiana's itinerant vision rehabilitation therapy program. Then she left us, boo-hoo, and moved to Alabama. Good for them. Um, she served as a faculty instructor working with students while and earning their master's degree in rehabil rehabilitation teaching and vision rehabilitation therapy at Northern Illinois University. And she spent two and a half years as an associate professor at Korea Nazarene University in Chonan City, South Korea. So uh, when she was in Alabama, she worked as an itinerant vision rehabilitation therapist at Mobile and Gadsden. And then she was promoted in 2010 with the state of Alabama, and she is currently serving as the coordinator of vision rehabilitation therapist and orientation and mobility specialist for Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services. So welcome, Lenore. Thank you. I am so glad to be here. I wish that I could run around the room and give everybody a great big hug. And I wish I could throw out prizes and candy and, and all kinds of goodies as we as we talk and um, gather and, and have fun, but but I can't I we can't do that. So this is my first experience with um being the leader of a virtual group and i'm already sitting here shaking my boots so uh i just ask your forgiveness but i'm so glad to be i'm so glad to be with you um i want to tell just a little bit about my background um i loved um working in indiana i worked for indiana for over about 23 years. I worked for the Allen County League for the Blind for a little bit. And um, as, as Becky said, I worked in Lafayette as an itinerant teacher and I worked at Bosma. Yay, Bosma. And um, then I worked at Northern Illinois. But what I want to take a side trip on and tell you just a little bit about because we have a lot of TBIs and a lot of um, a lot of O&Ms in the, in the meeting here. So I want to tell you just a tiny bit, I was able to spend about two and a half, almost three years in Korea, in Chonan City, South Korea, and international service was not on my radar. I did not think of doing anything internationally out of the country. I never thought about doing anything outside of Indiana. And I was just blessed with the opportunity to work both in Korea and Alabama, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But a lot of times we think, you know, a visually impaired person, a person who is blind or a person who is um, low vision, you know, you don't think of international opportunity as a, a option. And please do, you know, as you guys work with, uh, your, your students, please think of international opportunity as an option. And if by chance people are thinking about that, helping them, help them explore that because it is a really good opportunity. And I hope that um, it, it has really changed my life. And I hope that before I transfer out of this world I, into heaven, that I can do one more international experience because it has meant so much to me. And it has been real, real good. So change brings opportunity. When I thought about naming, what am I going to name this presentation? I thought, my first thought was change brings opportunity or threat. And I like to be more of a positive type person. And 
I like to think more of the opportunity. But um, I think throughout this throughout this presentation, we'll have to be a little bit balanced and look at the threat the threat side also. But we'll have to look, at, you know, at, at both. Um, One of the things I wanted to tell you, this is going back to Korea a little bit. Um, when I worked in Korea, my students, my English speaking students, my Korean brothers and sisters that I absolutely love and who spoke English would have a tendency to put an E on the end of certain words. Like, are you going to churchy today? Have you eaten lunchy yet? Have you... Um, have you voted or are you going to vote for bushy um, or you have bushy hair or bushy eyebrows and they would always leave an e on the end of the word and they would always say changey and they would get all upset changey and um that is something that i have felt through the pandemic even though I wasn't working at the time, I felt like changey, it, it affects everyone and it affects our profession. And I think we as a profession has, have done very, very well with it. And one of the things I wanna do today is celebrate the um, challenges that we have overcome and we have done well, but our change hit change hit overnight and it hit us hard and you know i think we as a profession probably did better than most i think we did very well because of the nature of our jobs we're all creative anyhow we're very creative people i mean who else can thread a needle with a piece of paper or who else can um, measure the laundry detergent with the turkey baster? And there are so many things that we can do that are a little bit off the beaten path. And we think a little bit off the beaten path. So coming up with some of the ideas that to work remotely, um, it was not really hard for us. So I'm real proud of us in that respect. And um, it was Winston Churchill who said, a pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity. And an optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. And I think we have been optimists and it's my desire that we continue to be optimists. Um, one thing I wanna say as we go along and sort of a disclaimer is that I know one of the good things about this is that we have people from all over the country. I recognize some Alabama names, yay. And um, even from outside of the country, I think we have a few people and I am very, very glad for that. And we all had a different way of dealing with the pandemic and starting um, dealing with dealing with the pandemic we've all we're all at various different stages uh some of us have done lots and lots of things and some of us haven't done very much and we're all kind of we're all different and but when i list some of the possible problems or some of the challenges or that could even be possible threats i'm talking about how i see them and basically how I see them as a retired person. When I started working at this, I thought, part of me thought, well, I'm a retired person. I'm an outside person looking in and that's a bad thing. And then I thought, but I'm a retired person. I'm an outside person looking in and that's a good thing. Uh, so there's a little bit of good and a little bit bad, but I'm going to um, address maybe some of the things as I think about them. And then hopefully what we're going to do do after I speak for a few minutes, 
after I speak for just a few minutes, then we'll divide into groups and we'll kind of work on some of the challenges and see if you know you guys think the problems that I have identified or the possible problems I identified to see if if what you think, you know, if, if there are problems at all, and what we can do about it and how we can how we can handle them and come up with a plan. Um, and at the end, what I want to do is come up, each person come up with a personal plan. Because I think, at least for me, when I'm working, it's when I have a problem or a challenge in my job, it's so good just to come up with a plan and of action of what I'm going to do. And then that helps, you know, what I can do to solve my part of the problem in my sphere of influence, even if it's real small. And at the end, I'll share my plan of action with you because I have a little plan as a retired person. So um, I want to talk a little bit about where we were before the pandemic. Um, most of us, and I am, have to say I'm the president of the club, we're pretty kind of comfortable. Um, comfortable with our profession, comfortable with what we were doing. I saw some potential challenges in the background, um, which I'll talk about in just a second. and. I think a lot of people did, but you know, I had been working in this profession 43 years and I had seen problems and some very serious ones come and go and we were okay. We managed to do all right. And I thought, oh, you know, we'll, we'll be okay. You know, we'll be okay until I transfer on to heaven. And um, actually, when the pandemic hit, it just turned us upside down. So some of the problems that I see is one, as a profession, we weren't and still aren't, and I will probably talk about this several times because I think it's a major problem. Um, we weren't as well known as we should be. Uh, we weren't you know, known throughout the country and um, known what we do and how we do it. And I think to, there are several different professions here as represented. There's TVIs and there's VRTs and there's O&Ms and there's low vision therapists. And I think probably I come from the VRT background and we probably have that pro pro problem more than any of you guys do. But it's still there, even for the O&Ms and for others, you know, people just don't know what we do and how we do it. And I see that as a problem in a couple areas, and I'll talk about more in a few minutes, but um, I see that in a problem in recruiting. And I also see that as a problem or a challenge um, with getting clients, with getting consumers now. So I'm interested in hearing, you know, some of your feedback and um, to see if you think that might be a challenge or not. Um, another challenge area that, that I see that we have had is the challenge of um, scheduling. And most of my work, most of my background, I've worked, of course, at Bosma, and I've worked at the Allen County League for the Blind in the Northern Illinois, but most of my work has been itinerant, both in Indiana and in Alabama. And I love itinerant, but scheduling has always been a problem, a challenge, and it's getting to serve people. Uh, do, are we able to serve enough people? And we've gone to maybe more group lessons, which I think is a good thing. Um, I, before I left Alabama, a big thing of mine was I wanted to see if we could cluster 
our appointments more in geographically cluster them and have shorter lessons, but maybe see our people more often. And um, I still think that is a real good idea. And I still think maybe with virtual learning, that's something that we can do maybe a little bit uh, with a little more ease and comfort than we could before. Um, another problem or another challenge I, I think about is did we really produce enough outcomes and we did we were the outcomes justified in our documentation and um i was when i worked i was a big person on documentation and uh sometimes i think our documentation didn't always justify the need for our services so those are some of the some of the things that i wanted to talk about as far as where we were before the pandemic. And I think we were just a little bit too comfy. I think we saw them and probably several the problems I mentioned and others problems kind of looming in the background. But I think we've been just a little bit comfy. Um, also, I do want to take another side note a minute and mention a couple of the handouts. I put tons and tons of handouts in for you. Really, some are really good handouts. And um, I just wanted to mention a, a few. One is, it comes from Alabama. A couple of the good handouts come from Alabama. And um, it's, what to, do you do if you go to a home appointment? Because now in Indiana, I don't know how many home appointments we're having or seeing, but I know in Alabama, because they have the blessing of a little nicer weather than we have, you know, they can go out to homes and sit on the patio or balcony or um, take, they actually take the lawn chairs with them. Um, so they can go out and go out and have lessons, but it has some really good ideas of, um, how to um, how to prepare for a lesson and maybe some ideas of how to dress, how to pack your um, paperwork and any supplies, any goodies that you have to take. Um, it just has some real good ideas. And I do have permission from the author, you know, to share this with you guys. And the other one also comes from Alabama and when as we do lessons virtually wording is so important in choosing our wording and finding the right words and it's really hard to connect with visually impaired people um online and so this person just gives some wonderful wonderful ideas of how to um teach a different skill and how to teach skills and how to use words so that even though you're not there to reach out and grab a person's hand because virtual teaching is so much more difficult if the teacher is visually impaired the student's visually impaired or the teacher is hearing impaired um it, it's just much it just has so many more difficulties and I feel some of the difficulties right now trying, I think this is a good experience for me, you know, just trying to do this presentation because I can't, I can't hear. Yes, I can't hear, you know. Oh, Carrie, you're laughing at my bad jokes or anything. So um, it's been a real good experience for me. But now go back to the presentation. I want to talk a little bit about celebration. I think we need to celebrate our accomplishments. And I think the big celebration is we turned potential gloom into Zoom overnight. And doing online teaching and webinars, we have done it a really fantastic job. And um, I'm so proud of our profession. I'm so proud of Indiana and Alabama and, and we have many other states represented. I'm proud of everyone because we've just done a really fantastic, fantastic job. 
Um, another thing I'm real proud of is that we work together and as different agencies. I know here in Indiana that FSSA worked a lot with Bosma and with Crossroads. And we put our heads together and, and work together to solve some of these problems. And then we even gone beyond that and that we work with other agencies um, throughout the state that we represented and work with some of the problems that people have because of COVID. So now we know where to refer people so that if clients or people would call in and um, say, oh, I'm having trouble getting my groceries. So we would have some ideas of where to, where to, um, where to send them. And I'm real glad for that. And then the other thing that I think is real neat, we're lifelong learners. And I think you have to be a lifelong learner all the time. And even though I'm in the retirement crowd, I consider myself to be a lifelong learner. And AER especially, but all of our agencies, I'm so proud of AER International because we have more webinars and ways to get CEUs and ways to expand our growth uh, professionally and personally than we have had before. And to me, it has been so great. Um, I'm, I'm just so I'm just so very grateful for that, for the opportunity to expand our growth, which um, it was especially important for me as a, as a person who was retired. But I think as we were working, um, and this was my observation as I'm working um, with people, that everyone's so busy and with the pandemic, a lot of us don't even know what we're doing, but we're so busy doing it uh, that it's just good to have times where we have opportunity to grow. And uh, a little shout out to Bosma. Um, I'm so proud of Bosma in that Technology Tuesday has been a wonderful, wonderful thing um, as far as uh, getting technology lessons out to the general, to the public, to the blind and visually impaired public, and it's been a wonderful thing. Also, the Connections Program at Bosma, and the Connections Program actually started before COVID-19, and um, it was already in place, and it's a program where uh, kind of like site loss support groups, because you know site loss support groups are so important. And um, people can't always, even before COVID, people have difficulty with transportation and can't always get to site loss support groups. So Bosma has done a wonderful job with providing a connections throughout the state of Indiana so people can call in and they can talk about different topics. Uh, some would be site loss support group oriented, some would be um, crossword puzzles, um, just a variety of different topics. And I, I think that would that is just wonderful. So I'm just real proud of the way in which um, Bosma has come and uh, kind of led the way for at least a lot of us here in Indiana. Um, I do want to talk a little bit, and then we'll divide into groups, but I wanna talk a little bit about what I see as potential threats. And I hope that they're challenges. And I, like I said before, we're all in different ways of dealing with it. And I hope that um, we have lots of ideas and lots of things in the works already. And I hope that maybe some of the things that I've thought about aren't even going to be problems at all. But, you know, they're just some ideas. And um, I will go through kind of four ideas that I think might be possible 
challenges that we have to work through. But I think we can because we're all positive folks and we can always see the opportunity in all of these challenges. But one I've already talked about a little bit is that our profession is not well known. And a lot of people don't know us. And I think that affects us in two ways. One, I wonder if we're getting the referrals that we need, our consumers, our program participants, if we're getting um, the folks, if people know about us, if children and adults who have visual disabilities know that we're in existence and know that we're around and can help. And I don't know if you, I think you guys are like me, you don't like secrets very well. But um, we're a well-kept secret. And I really think as far as getting new people in to the profession, which when I worked in Alabama, part of my job and the part I, I really liked the best and I think was probably best at was recruiting new people. And boy, did I love it. And it was really hard work and we took two strategies one we um tried to find people qualified for the jobs we had available the o ms and vrts that we had available then and then the other strategy was grow our own try to find people um, in alabama send them to school to western michigan or to northern illinois or boston college um, to get degrees in o &M or VRT. And that we were able to get a lot of people, but some of them didn't go back to Alabama. <laughs> but um, that was a big thing. Now, when I was studying for this presentation, I learned and I was really excited that in our VRT programs and our o &M programs, we have more students now than we have had in the past. And um, one of my friends who teaches from Northern Illinois said, well, I have 12 students in my class. And I thought, boy, when I worked at Northern Illinois, we didn't have that many. So I was just real proud and um, real glad for that. But then there's also another problem that I see kind of looming in the background is doing internships and getting people uh, in internships because I know right now from talking to some of my friends who work for um, colleges and universities and university programs, there's like several months or possibly even a year waiting list just to get an internship. And we need to get people out working as soon as as possible. And I think the reason for the lack of internship is that people don't want two and three and four people coming into their homes or more people coming into their homes. So that's a little bit of a, of a dilemma or a problem. Another one that has hit us is I think ethics. And a lot of you guys might know a lot more about this than I do and might be able to help a lot more, but um, we all have a code of ethics for our profession, but I think the VR counselors, and I know there are several VR counselors in uh, this group, you guys have the very uh, most inclusive code of ethics in that it includes social media. And I think we need to beef up some of our code of ethics to include social media. And I'm a little bit afraid of um, classes doing, during Zoom. Uh, I think a lot of agencies, including FSA, FSSA has gone more to teams and um, because it might be a little more secure. But I think security, I think doing things over the phone as much as we do now, um, I'm just a little more, a little bit concerned about that. And I'm interested in kind of seeing what y'all think. And another one, now this one, I don't feel like I know much about. And um, 
Ashley Thompson, at Townsend, I know you're there. And uh, I almost called you in preparation for this. Um, another one I'm thinking about is funding. And I'm worried, you know, are we well enough known? Will we get the funding we need? Are we creative enough to get the, the funding and the sources of funding that we need? Um, I'm a little bit concerned about that. And I'm also concerned about, you know, have we done a good enough job not only promoting ourselves, but um, with our written documentation, really justifying the need for our services? So those are some things I've, I've been thinking about. And then there's one more area, and this is a little bit off the track a little bit, but I think it's important, and that's community outreach. And one of the things that we've done as BRTs and ONMs and TBIs is that we've done a little bit community outreach to hospitals and doctor's offices and schools and um, community centers and churches, you know, talking about blindness and visual impairments and how to work with a person who is blind or visually impaired. And because all of us want our students to get out and about and be an active part of their community. And that is very, very important to every one of us. And um, it seems to me being a blind person who has gone out and traveled a little bit lately, but not as much as I used to, and it seems to be a little more difficult and that people don't really know how to deal with a blind or visually impaired person as much. And we went out, you know, and we used to go out and do a lot of in-service trainings, but I think that's gonna be a little more difficult now than it used to be because people from all professions are just like us and they're they don't really know um they don't really have time to schedule an in-service training so i'm thinking one of the things we might want to do is develop quote canned presentations um develop more written material that can be handed out or digital type presentations that we can, that people can just listen to at their own time. And um, so I'm interested in hearing, in hearing your comments on that. So what we're going to do, Jennifer, I think, Jennifer, Jennifer, are you with us? Um, I think Jennifer's going yes, to, I'm here. okay. Okay, I think Jennifer's going to take the lead on this and divide us into like four rooms. Um, I just I just put in the chat. There's going to be eight rooms. Oh, rooms one and five will discuss funding. Okay. Two and six ethics. Three and seven community education and public awareness and um, four and eight program and professional recognition. Okay, so what I want you to do is choose which one that, which one you like, uh, which one is most important to you, which one do you know the most about? And you can make that choice, you know, go to ever at whatever area that you feel most comfy in that you feel like you can contribute the most. Then I put together just a few questions and we have them in our handouts and they're the ones that it starts with part two. I did four series of questions and they're all they all start with part two. So it's part two ethics, part two funding, part two community awareness, part two professional recognition. And um, if you can find those, but if not, I can tell you um, basically what they are. It's basically, all I want you to do is to identify some of the challenges that, that we have, what are some creative solutions, what are some creative solutions to um, coming up with those challenges and dealing with the challenges? And then a personal, a personal action plan as to what you wanna do. Then we will gather here together as a group 
and we will go through all four areas and you can tell um you can say anything you want to you can you can talk about any of the problems or challenges and if you have additional problems other than the ones i missed it i've listed yes please include those and um i'm hoping that it'll be a gathering time and i hope it'll be fun because one of the things i don't think we've had enough fun uh, since COVID-19. So I hope we can talk about our challenges and have fun, and then we'll come back and then I'll share my action plan with you also. Okay, and I, Lenore, you will have to unmute yourself and start your video again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. And, oh, Oh, okay. Okay, I have been able to participate a little bit in some of the groups and we had a little time, you know, getting started with some of the people and some of the groups and some of the groups were just where we did um, very well and a lot of good things. But what I want to do is um, first talk about the topic of um, professional recognition and I think we had two groups, two rooms assigned to that. And um, one of the things I forgot to say, I'm, I'm real sorry, I, I was thinking, when we get into the groups, you know, there's always one person who likes to be the leader and likes to talk and likes to be the spokesperson. And um, so we can choose that person, but if not, um, we can choose like whoever's newest in the field because we need to, find leaders, but uh, who would like to, Jenny, do you want to just chime in here and assign? Well, I think if, if, if anybody has anything that they want to share from their group, um, just unmute yourself and okay, make yourself known. Don't be shy. Cricket. This is Christy Hughes, and um, I was in that group with professionalism and so on. Unfortunately, we did not get to that because we were chatting just about our, you know, different areas and people we serve and so on. So unfortunately, we failed the assignment. I'm so sorry. Um, but um, it was a good opportunity for us to just compare and support each other and, you know, make sure that we felt like we were both on the same track. Um, this is, this is Lenore, and I wanted to say you didn't fail the assignment, because my main thing is I wanted people to have fun and have an opportunity to talk and chit chat and um, look at some of the challenges that we face, but in a more creative fashion. And I think you did that. So I don't think there was a, I don't think this assignment was pass fail by any means. And I hope some other people chime in with some of the, because I heard some good things. Well, this is Renee. I'll chime in for group four. I don't have my video on. Can you all hear me okay? Hello? Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, we Hello? talked to, we talked about something kind of interesting about uh, developing programs to train people in some of the professions, such as O&M and IRT. We were talking about a lot of the really well-known programs are out of state, so perhaps developing uh, programs in the state at some of our local universities and getting interns, uh, you know, working with our agencies such as Bosma here. So I know that was one of the things we talked about that, that I thought would be a really good thing. I think that's real interesting and real, real good thing to, I mean, we, we just have to do something about, about finding more folks, I think. I think we're doing better than we were, but any, anything else? 
I was with a group that was uh, group three, but we couldn't remember what our topic was. So we kind of made up our own topic. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, many of the things that we discussed were how to encourage people to make social connections and how to feel a part of a community. And uh, we oh, had a lot of interesting ideas about that. We also spent some time talking about services for the elderly and how to get them connected um, with services, particularly if they are in rural areas and might be the only person with a visual impairment that they've ever heard of and how to make connections to the resources. And then we also talked about how for some people, just making the connection with the resources is beyond their capacity at this point in time. And what were some of your ideas? Um, we talked about trying to connect, um, for example, uh, if the elder, uh, an elderly person uh, there might be two grandmas that you might be servicing and maybe they would want to get connected so they could, you know, talk about grandkids or mm -hmm. recipes or something like that. Yeah. Um, just to, a way to have a one-on-one -on -one connection. And we also kind of talked a little bit about the things that Mark spoke about with Hadley and how that has become a much more personal and interactive yes. program that that might be a good source of uh, contact for people as well. Hadley is wonderful. It's just a wonderful opportunity. Any more ideas or connects anything that you came up with? Um, this is Jessica Hunt. Uh, <laughs> we uh, discussed that how important it is to um, kind of talk up the profession in general when people ask you what you yes. do living, and making sure that uh, you're making people aware that blind and visually impaired people are out there. Mm -hmm. This is Kat Basic. I was in group run. We were supposed to talk about funding. And I will say that we, we definitely ranged into probably all the topics, but the questions for funding that we answered is COVID absolutely does affect the funding, whether it's government, federal, state, or nonprofit. Um, and then we found that the best way to try to work on getting the funding is really coming back to knowledge and reaching out the people, the instructors in the field, being able to communicate in part with the people who hold the purse strings, whether it is personal donors, mm -hmm. government, state, or federal, and getting those people down into the field and showing them, look, this is what we're doing and this is why it's important. Let's put a blindfold on and take a walk. Let's uh, put a blindfold on and wash the dishes or organize your cabinet, do your laundry, whatever it might be, or write an email, use the voiceover on your phone, whatever it could be. But getting those people who control that to actually see what we're doing so they know what this yes. is going towards and bet you 10 bucks, they know somebody who could use that service. Yes. They themselves won't eventually have to use it. But really it comes down to, to get that funding. We've got to make okay. that connection with the people who have the purse strings. Yes. So knowledge and funding go hand in hand. And that's a real good idea. And that could be like in your personal action plan that, you know, some things that you can do. Those are all wonderful ideas. Anything else? Um, I was also, I was in group five, which was also discussing funding and uh, none of us were particularly um, qualified to speak on that as a uh -huh deal directly with the funding. Um, but we did discuss how, you know, one of the efforts we could take uh, to help increase funding in our respective areas was uh, just kind of making ourselves known, like Jessica had mentioned, um, making our communities, uh, local organizations that might be willing to contribute to what we do, aware that we are out there, that districts are struggling financially. Um, I had mentioned how our district last year teamed up with our local Lions Club to host a picnic for our local families and that funding really helped us. Um, so maybe just reaching out to some like non-traditional funding sources outside of the traditional 
her string holders um, and getting our community involved with helping support these individuals. That's a wonderful idea. Do you have any ideas of who might, you might contact non-traditional? Um, well, as I said, um, we had partnered with the Lions Club last okay. year. Um, they were one. Other than that, um, uh, the gal that was in the group from the Indiana School for the Blind, she said that they work with an organization that helps with a lot of their funding. Um, uh -huh. But other than that, even just, you know, community members that might, you know, want to throw in a few dollars or help, you know, maybe yeah. rant or something or know of any leads. Um, as far as me personally, I'm I'm not very well informed on that. My supervisor is the one that handles most of that. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Anything, anyone, anyone else? Is the gentleman here who pastors a church and has done some work with food lines, is he here? Can you talk yeah, about that? I'm Ralph Perkheiser. Okay. And, uh, I work, my primary job is with a Center for Independent Living. I'm an outreach coordinator or a center, we change titles, I'm an independent living coordinator. And we work with people with all kinds of disabilities, not just blind, but I do have several blind consumers and refer quite often with to uh, Bosma. But uh, as far as getting the word out, I go, anywhere there are people. Now it's kind of hard now after uh, COVID, but I would be at the food pantries when they would be coming through and just have a little piece of paper about independent living to give to them as they left with my phone number on it. And I got a lot of callbacks because people would see that, yes, I can need, need some help and they would call me back. Uh, I'll also speak a little bit on funding because I've kind of got a reputation for that. I'm also a pastor, as she mentioned, a pastor of two small churches. So I'm used to twisting arms. And uh, I do a lot of arm twisting. Just this last weekend, I got a group from a from Gordon's Food Service that uh, once in a while, they'll let some of their employees come on a Friday and do a project. We put up a uh, ramp in one day for a gentleman who is in a wheelchair and also blind. Uh, I've written grants to many corporations. Check the corporations in your area. I got a $20,000 grant from a local telephone company to do things for people in Orange County uh, last year. $20,000 isn't a huge amount of money, but it built several ramps that uh, helped put a roof on a house that bought doors for people that whose doors were about to fall in and, and a simple thing as putting up a new door can sometimes uh, save them a lot of money on their electric bill uh, because the heat's been all going out through that door that had a big hole in it. So uh, sometimes you can make a difference in people's lives with some little things. And don't be afraid to ask somebody to help you. I don't I don't go begging for myself, but I, I'll beg for, for my consumers <laughs> any day. Unashamed. Yes. Um, this I feel like you're uh, you're giving an opportunity to people. It's not begging. You're just giving an opportunity to people to help. And some people want to, but they don't know what to do. So they're just a, to be aware of a need is really important for people. Mm -hmm. and the Bible says, when we've done it to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me. So if, if you want to send something ahead for for God, that's the way to do it. Do it for somebody that's needing help. It also connects people in the community and helps there to be partnerships, you know, great partnerships. Yeah. This is Shar Maternowski Paul. Walgreens uh, often will allow employees to do uh, service projects within communities and continue to pay their people for the days that they donate to an organization. We discovered that a year or two ago. Um, I don't know if that's still the case now, but if you've got a um, Walgreens in your community, it might be worthwhile stopping in and talking to the manager and see if they participate in that program. 
That is really neat. That's a similar sort of thing that Gordon's food uh, that we did this weekend. It's kind of fun because they have like, a, I'm in the middle of Southern Indiana in Orange and Crawford counties. I live uh, in West of Aden Springs and uh, they have offices around the state. And sometimes these are people that they email back and forth or <laughs> talk to on the phone, but they never get to be with. So when they meet to do a service project, they're actually getting to see some of the people from their own corporation that they wouldn't otherwise see. I love these ideas. Do you have any more? Uh, I wanted to share something that okay. uh, I found out in my group. Um, again, we were off topic, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> like so many others, but we still yes. learned things. Um, we were introducing ourselves, you know, talking about who we were, where we're uh -huh. from. And one of the people in my group, Sarah, um, is a counselor. And one of her specialties is helping people um, with disabilities, especially newfound disabilities. And she herself used to be a certified vision rehabilitation therapist. Yes, yes. I just thought that was neat. I didn't know a person like that existed in Indiana. Well, um, it's, it's, it's one of it's a real exciting thing it's my area of expertise and um yes there are certified vision rehabilitation therapists in indiana and we used to be known as rehabilitation teachers and uh, by long about 2004 they changed the name to certified vision rehabilitation therapists and i would like to see more in indiana than we have right now but we have um we're, we're taking a little different route, but, and of course, um, Basma, you know, so yes, we do have certified oh, vision no. rehabilitation. What I meant, she, she used to be a uh, CVRT, but now she's uh -huh. actually a counselor and she uh -huh. helps counsel uh, adults and children who have recent disabilities or yeah, who recently I have lost their vision. Uh -huh. I just, I just didn't know uh, that there were therapist specific to that. Uh-huh. Well, that's good. Lenore, it is yes. Katrina. Oh, yay! <laughs> um, I think that a barrier to getting people uh, into the profession, the VRT, uh -huh. um, is that to get the education or to get even the certification, you have to really have an undergrad. And I, I, I know people here locally that are wanting badly to either get certification or the proper education uh -huh. to be qualified, and, but they don't have the undergrad or the qualifications to get certification. And I, you know, we found uh -huh. that NIU has an yes. on-campus program, uh -huh. but not distance learning, and this person is rooted oh, here. So yeah. I find that to be a very frustrating barrier. Oh, I know. I know. And I was going to suggest Northern Illinois NIU because they just started their program, and I, I think it'll be real good, and I'm glad that, I'm glad that they started it. Oh, yeah. It's nice. Um, but do you have any idea? I mean, we don't have a lot of opportunities um, in the profession, whether it's master's level or not, but golly, why is that? Why do you have to have an undergrad in order to get into the profession? Do you have any idea? Well, it's actually, you have to have, they, it was until recently that you had to have like your master's degree, you know, in, in VRT, but now it, it's, I'm glad it's going to undergraduate, but we really need to have, you know, as much training as possible, but I'm still think maybe 
do it. I mean, we need to explore different opportunities because well, the problem that we have is very serious, I think. And mm -hmm. we can work for this, through the subject matter expert committee, I think, to explore various opportunities through ACVREP. Yep. That's all I have. I'm glad to hear you. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, I hope this has been fun. My um, goal was I wanted to, to be fun because I don't think anyone's really had it very much fun since COVID. And I hope it was a good opportunity. And um, I told you that I would share some of my, um, what one of my action plans and what of, one of the things I wanted to do is, um, and I forgot to tell you in my introduction that I really, even though I don't work for FSSA anymore, as far as the, my part-time job, I'm still busy and I write for Vision Aware and have done that um, for probably nine years. I've worked for Vision Aware and loved it, but didn't write very much because I had a full-time job. And then when I came to Indiana, part-time job, it kind of kept me busy and I didn't really write very much, but I've cranked out about six articles since May 8th. And um, I also write for a church, uh, write a missions newsletter for, or not an article for a missions newsletter for one of the churches that I've been going to. And um, so I've been keeping real busy. But the one thing that I started doing when COVID first came out was I started collecting resources. Well, where do you find this? And where do you find um, different things that our consumers might need? Or where do you find a variety of resources? Or where can I find literature on different topics? And as a retired person, I can do that. So I want to offer, um, my assistance and in doing that and you're very welcome to send me an email and I will try my best to find resources or information for you because um, I feel like uh, I'm retired now and I can I can do some of those things so and anything that we can do to help our profession because I know you guys when you're working and you're on the front line and you know you don't always have time to look for a talking thermometer and um, look for different things that are available. So I thank you for your time and effort and I um, wanted to find a joke to leave you with but I didn't find it didn't do that. <laughs> I wasn't able to find one good enough. Um, so I just want to say thank you and good night. Thank you, Lenore. Thank you. We greatly appreciate it. So if you watch your email in the next couple of days, you should be getting a special thank you email from us. Oh, well, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so this concludes our session. This, in, this concludes the day, I believe. So make sure you fill out the evaluations and um, the code, the end code word is opportunity. So op 